might just talk a while. <laughs> Stretch, stretch, stretch it. Thank you so much. David Mason uh, has been a Manamnock region citizen, specifically Peterborough, since 1994. He, however, didn't start here. He grew up in Northeast Ohio, went off to college at Carnegie Mellon, uh, was really involved in technology that time went off to California and started to steer towards the arts. He came to McDowell, as it is now called. I have to be careful. Uh, in 1994, as the resident manager, went on to become the resident director and is now the acting director of McDowell. He was not at McDowell when the first medalist was given the award, who knows who the first medalist was? Thornton Wilder. Thornton Wilder, appropriately enough, or the third, who was the third one? Uh, Aaron Copeland. Second. Oh, he was the second. I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Whose woods these are, oh. I don't know. Robert, 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 Robert Cross. But he has been there uh, for some, a lot of medalists, including some of my favorites. Stephen Sondheim for one, Sonny Rollins for jazz fans, and my all-time favorite medalist, Roseanne Cash. Did you meet any of them? I did. I met most of them, and a lot of them stayed with me. At well, uh, now to our online uh, participants, of which we have quite a few, and to those of you in the room, it's my pleasure to introduce David Mason. Good evening, everybody. It is lovely to be here with you. Um, thank you for postponing to get out of the deep freeze last week. Um, I want to start by thanking Joe. Really appreciate the invitation. And Becca for your hospitality here. And Ed for managing what uh, has been a little bit of a, a to-do with my technological deficiencies. Um, I also am obliged to a couple of people I work with, Colette Lucas, Jody Garnick, and Jonathan Gourlay are all, all helped pull together some of the images and data that I'll show tonight. Um, and the biggest thanks, I think, goes to all the way back to McDowell's founding, Edward and Marion McDowell, all the people who supported the program, and all of the artists who've actually come through Peterborough and crafted the stories, some, a few of which I'm gonna share tonight. Um, so let me get take a temperature of the room. How many folks here have been attended a medal day at McDowell? All right, so I am preaching to the converted. That's good. <laughs> um, I will not need to spend a lot of time uh, on, at the beginning, but um, on a little bit of information, uh, vis visual information um, in the form of a few graphs. Um, and what I will do this evening, I'm, I'll, I'll try and uh, I won't hold myself t too tightly to this structure, but I'm going to talk about McDowell as, a, as first as an idea and then as a place and finally uh, about as, as being about the 8,800 artists who come through Peterborough over the course of the last 115 years. So um, you're familiar with McDowell as it is today, but it, is in, it, it, it was an invention in effect of uh, Edward and Marion McDowell um, because of Edward's, uh, his, exp his unique experience as one of America's most famous first uh, truly American composers using American themes in his music and not just derivative of European forms. Um, he was a founding member of the Amer American Academy in Rome, and he saw that institution as a backwards-looking organization um, that was a place for American artists to go and 
get, gain a sense of where we had come from. Um, and what he and Mrs. McDowell dreamed of building was in fact a place that would be looking forward and into the future of where the culture was being fabricated by the artists who would be in residence at McDowell. Um, Edward, uh, in addition to being a noted composer, was also a poet, uh, a journeyman architect, and an avid photographer. He saw all of the arts as coming from a single place and found all of the disciplines and the, the boundaries between them arbitrary. Um, he was a little bit like Black Mountain College before Black Mountain College. Um, and what he found in Peterborough was a place where he accessed, the, the, he saw all the arts coming from a single source and he found that working summers in Peterborough, he was able to access that source more deeply and fully than anywhere else he'd ever experienced in his life. And toward, he was, he was uh, diagnosed with a terminal illness in three years before he actually died in 1908. Um, and in that period, he and his wife, Marion, um, dreamed about how they could pay it forward and take what he had drawn so much inspiration from and hand it off to artists that um, were, didn't have access to that in their own uh, daily lives. He, he had actually started the, mu the music program at Columbia University. Um, he was a, an established artist by comparison uh, to the ar first artists who would come to McDowell. Um, let's see. So one of the things that um, all the McDowell started out, it was, it was a solitary program uh, in the United States and one by one more and more of them have come into being. Um, I, for nine years, served on the board of a group called the Alliance of Artist Communities. Uh, it's a national organization. It's a consortium of all similar programs. And in the, the, there are now, I think, 500 programs who participate in that, in, as members in that organization. Um, and you can find McDowell's DNA, the idea of McDowell, it, to spread in them uh, all over the place. It was, um, I think that Joe in his introduction mentioned that I lived in California for a while. I had uh, found my way through good fortune to working at a place called the Jirasi Resident Artist Program. And the founder of that program was Carl Jirasi. He's a noted biochemist and uh, so-called inventor of the birth control pill. Um, he uh, had a tragedy in his family and he wanted to convert his daughter's estate into an artist residency program. He made the trip to Peterborough in the late 70s and soon after started the Jirasi program. Uh, so while I was working at another program 3,000 miles away, I was already in fact um, drinking up from the, the source that the, the McDowell's had set into motion. Um, so as an, as an idea that's, that's spread throughout the country, we'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about, well, what do they all have in common? Um, and um, all the contemporary residency programs have uh, a, an artist selection process, an inspiring location, a studio or studios for solitary work, um, most of them have delicious food and comfortable accommodations, uh, and all of them have opportunities to act, interact with other artists. Um, some operate on a semester basis, like the American Academy in Rome, but the vast majority are seasonal and or year-round, as is McDowell. The program that's most often compared to McDowell is Yado, which uh, is, um, I think it's a good example of how um, the same idea manifests very, very differently according to the origin story of the founders. Um, uh, Katrina and Spencer Trask, uh, he was a financier, she was a writer, 
that they had a country estate in uh, Saratoga, New York, and um, in their will they set up a trust so that that their, the mansion and the gardens there would become a residency, uh, which I think it opened in 1925. Um, by contrast, McDowell is um, is centered in a, a, what was a barn, a 1790s barn that's been converted into a giant living room and dining room. Um, and uh, the simple, the, all the studios, the 31 studios are spread out on 450 acres. Um, they are simply appointed, um, but fully functional uh, for exactly what the artists want to do. Um, and be, because the, the studios and the facilities at residency programs really define what's possible and what's not possible for the people who come, um, I've spoke, focused a great deal of my energy on renovations and new construction. And over the last 25, 30 years, um, we have uh, invested over $11 million in capital improvements at McDowell, all of that money going right into the local economy and right into uh, the service of the mission. Um, let's see if I can move forward. Oh, my fault. Okay. Go ahead. So, to, I'll go through these quickly, but just to give you a sense of um, not just what of what what is happening in the world of uh, this arts ecosystem that supports artists in the United States. Um, you can on the if it's too small for you to see, this covers from 1994 to 2022. Um, each of the colors represents a different discipline but the total height of the column represents how many applications were received in that year. Um, and you can see that by 2012, we crossed the 1200 ap 2,500 application mark. And at that point, we, were f we felt that we couldn't process that many applications with the care and attention that they deserved. So we changed the rules and said, you can only apply every other year and not every year. Well, that worked for a few years. <laughs> and then there's a, you can see that there are um, essentially uh, no applications in, or the, or the applications were closed down in 2020 and 2021. And obviously there was a little bit of pent up demand. We've never seen anything like that. I kind of hope we never see anything like that again. Um, but the, um, the number of actual fellows that we're able to uh, accommodate uh, has been growing over time. It's one of the things that um, we have finite resource. We have a lot of people, obviously, who are pursuing it. If you look back at those, if you do the math here, um, 2,500 um, applications a year and about 300 artists are accepted for residency. Um, one of the ways that we actually measure the, um, how we're doing and delivering on the, on the mission is by artist days. It's like how many days of the year is each studio occupied. And when I started, we were in the 7,000 range and, um, by pressing and squeezing that, um, the puzzle pieces tighter together, we, we were able to get to about 9,000 artist days a year. Um, I think that that's probably enough statistical data for <laughs> anyone. Um, so I guess um, moving on to, to people, I think that the, the person who is most tightly associated with McDowell is Thornton Wilder um, and the fact that his play Our Town was finished or written in, at least in part, in Belton Studio in 1938. Um, 
that was that was he was one of many uh, artists who rose to prominence, and that association with McDowell was something that Mrs. McDowell uh, was very adept at using in order to attract greater attention. Um, in 1954, um, Mrs. McDowell was living in Los Angeles, and uh, through whatever way, whatever means she had at her disposal, she convinced uh, Hallmark Hall of Fame, which was then uh, doing live teleplays, to produce a dramatization of Edward and Marion McDowell's life and how they met and established the McDowell colony and the first 30 or 40 years of the, the program. Um, and I, I've shown that film over and over again to artists who are in residence. Um, and I, I do not stay to watch the whole thing anymore. But I always do make an effort to get back into the room before it ends. Because Mrs. McDowell herself, um, so there's been actors um, doing a rather B-movie job of portraying the history of the, of the McDowell's lives um, with a lot of trilled R's and overacting, but it was, it was really good fun. And then at the end, Mrs. McDowell comes out and I think she has one of the best opening lines I've ever heard. And, you know, she spoke with something of a patrician voice herself. She, and I think she said, it amuses me, as I think it does a great many people, that I should live to be nearly 100 years old before I was on TV. <laughs> and she goes on to, she, she was in fact 96 years old at that point. Um, she was entirely blind. Um, I've seen a lot of the correspondence that in the, in the files that she signed and it as towards the end of her life, her signature was just somewhere below the center line of the page, right over the text that had been typed up. Um, but you could see the spirit in her eyes in that moment um, that, that I'm sure that she was a pistol all her life. She, took, uh, she did not take no for an answer. Um, and uh, there is one other uh, line that one other moment in that film that always stays with me in that uh, things have changed so little at McDowell since it was started in 1907. Um, there's an actor playing the cook and she's talking to Edward Arlington Robinson and giving a little orientation or arrival lecture and um, what is she she says uh, now now breakfast is it 7.30 and lunch to deliver to your studio in a basket. Now at 6.30, you'll be back here for dinner. I won't be having me roast dry out, poems or no poems. <laughs> <laughs> and while we've, we've lost the bad accent, we still uh, maintain those exact same hours. Um, I think that that is one of the things, one of the reasons that there are so many residency programs at this point is that the essential building blocks that are on offer, the absence of distraction, the solitary time to work on a, on a project that one has been desiring to have access to for a long time, and then that complemented with being immersed in a community of people who you would never have met were it not for them also being very talented artists and being attracted to apply to that same place. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll tell, share a little bit of a story too about George Kendall. I don't know if any of you knew George. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> George, George was, um, George is actually a, a, an unsung hero, I'd say, a pivotal character in McDowell's history in that he was the general manager from 1951 to 1970. And so Mrs. McDowell was the, the charismatic leader, the embodiment of the organization, 
the chief fundraiser, the person who set the rules. Um, and so what happens when a, when a founder leaves the organization? Quite often chaos ensues and um, not on George's watch. Um, he had previously been the headmaster of the Kendall Hall School for Girls um, and Mrs. McDowell hired him to manage the program uh, in 1951. She soon after moved to Los Angeles, as I mentioned. And so now the organization wasn't Mrs. McDowell. The organization was the McDowell Colony. And George not only had the wherewithal to, um, you know, work to, to um, gain the trust of the board and raise additional funds, he was had the strategic vision to move the program from being a summer only residency to year round. Um, they hastily winterized as many studios as they could and from 1955 onward that has been how our programs operated. Um, he also, I also used to um, go and visit him at his home on, on Cheney Ave. Uh, he would introduce me to um, to various people from town over a sherry sitting next to his wood stove that was 180 degrees, making it 180 degrees in the room. Um, and he, uh, he, he gave me ad advice, including like what sort of tweed coats I ought to buy, which I, I haven't taken all of his advice, obviously, but um, uh, that was one of my one of my first gateways to the program. Another another um, another pivot point for me, I think, was my the first assignment I drew on arriving uh, relates to a composer by the name of Louise Talma. She um, had been coming to McDowell since 1943. She was on, in fact, uh, by 1994 and. October when I met her, she would be in residence for her 40th residency. Far by far head and shoulders above the number of residencies any other artist has ever uh, realized at McDowell. And so my job uh, was to tell Louise that she was no longer allowed to smoke in Colony Hall. <laughs> she was 93 years old, I think, at this point, and she had been smoking since in, in the, that, that building since 20 years before I was born. Um, I managed to get her to not smoke at the dining room table anymore, but to take her after dinner cigarette uh, in Bond Hall on a couch next to an open window. I, I declared victory and moved on. Um, she, Louise was, um, was, you know, she was a fierce intellect and she did not um, suffer fools. Um, and she had uh, taught at Hunter College for many, many years. And then uh, after retiring, she found that she could apply each year to, to Yaddo and to McDowell. And she would come go to Yaddo in September and come to McDowell in October. Um, and so I got to know her on, uh, in my first two years in 94 and 95. And in 96, she actually passed away in her sleep at Yaddo. And the, the sort of the irony of the story is that a few months later, we, uh, an executor of her estate got in touch to let us know that she had left basically all of her, her um, estate to McDowell. So um, is a woman who taught at was uh, taught music for 50 years, um, wore a wool coat with holes in the elbows and the same block heeled black shoes with resold every few years. It was surprising to learn that she had left nearly a million dollars to the program. Um, it also, my second assignment at McDowell, I'd say, was to build some bridges with the local community. Um, and I, I did, I took that to heart and um, I explored, my goal was to find ways to sustainably 
build connections between the artists who are coming to Peterborough and the people who are here and interested. Um, in 96, I got in touch with Gib West, who is at, at Conval, um, and we s set up an exploratory program we called McDowell in the Schools, um, and it uh, would be artists who would volunteer, would be taken in to visit students, teach a class, or present their work. Um, yeah, skipped. We're going backwards. Um, there we go. It is there. Um, and so that's that program started in 1996, and um, over over time, these things accumulate in impact. Um, over 200 artists have um, visited the school and reached over 5,000 students. One of the great things at McDowell, uh, McDowell's kitchen is that we employ a lot of those high school students as um, kitchen assistants. And a lot of those kitchen assistants have gone on to become artists. A lot of them enjoyed the, the McDowell and the schools program. And some of them have actually come back, moved away, and then moved back to Peterborough and are working at McDowell today. Um, I think maybe the most intense of those programs was um, Adrienne LeBlanc uh, wrote a book called Random Family. Um, it is, she spent 10 years um, becoming very close with a, a, f a network of related um, people in the Bronx who were living in poverty and flipping from uh, ones from uh, being in gangs, dealing drugs, going to prison, having children when they're very young. Um, and the cycle of that poverty was what um, Adrian really studied and spent 10 years getting close with those families. Well, for her, McDowell, in the school's visit, she actually got three of the people who were figures in the story to come back to Peterborough and go into the classrooms with her and answer questions. So it's literally the people coming off the page um, to be in the classroom. Um, I had a, a chilling moment with a one of the young, a young man who had been in prison uh, for 14 years, had just recently been released, um, and he was talking, I was in the classroom with him, he was talking to the students who were marginal as to whether or not they were gonna graduate. They were the, the at-risk kid, kids in, at Conval, and um, he had gone to prison because he had accidentally killed a friend while they were robbing a store. Um, and somebody asked what I thought was a, it's a question that very much surprised me. One of the students asked if he was sorry. And he actually, um, you know, pulled his shirt open to show a tattoo that was his friend's name and an RIP. Like, yes, he was sorry. And that wasn't the remarkable thing so much as I saw in the classroom, one kid looking over at another after that exchange and, and the eye contact between them, I could tell that there was an apology happening without words in the room. I don't know what they had done, but um, it was a powerful moment. She also brought her high school English teacher into the classroom because her, her high, she had grown up in Lemonster didn't expect to go to college, and her high school English teacher had driven her to Smith College on an open house day to insist that she, in fact, could go to college. Um, all right, well, I digress on that. Um, uh, also, as noted there is McDowell downtown. Um, I hope that if you um, are interested in these, Listening to me talk, you'll find McDowell downtown tenfold of more of greater interest. It is uh, a program I started in 2001, and it 
it copies liberally from the artist practice of um, sharing their work with each other after dinner. We export that program to Bass Hall. Um, and I'm happy to announce tonight that the 2023 season will open on March 3rd uh, with uh, saxophonist and composer <coughs> Nora Stanley uh, performing. I just got a note back from her this afternoon. Um, I think I'll, 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 I'll skip maybe to um, a year, the year 2013. It was a year that a great deal uh, of many, many, many things happened in a short period of time that has um, really stayed with me. And I think it illustrates uh, the, the sort of compounding um, joy that can happen around at McDowell within the resident community. Um, in 2013, we opened uh, a library that was soon to be named the James Baldwin Library. It was a, a 4,000 square foot addition on a 1,000 square foot building. The, the original library was a, just a reading room. Um, and that is still my all time favorite um, building project. Uh, it was a real joy to work with Todd and Billy Will Todd Williams and Billy Chen were the architects. They're currently finishing the design for the Obama Library in Chicago. So for for them, this was a very small project, but is a project that they really they loved McDowell, and that is why they put so much into that design. Um, I I trust you'll return to Metal Day, and um, uh, so it was soon after that um, that library opened for the artist use uh, that there were two writers having a conversation at breakfast and they discovered that they had a, a, a common regret. They, they both wished that they had been in a band when they were younger and um, McDowell being a quasi-utopia um, they started rehearsing the next day and a week later um, uh, Kirk Johnson and Heidi Julevitz appeared, uh, performed an open mic night at, at Harlow's uh, pub. And the, every one of the artists who were in residence went down and then as, as soon as they had, the applause had died down, there were already two of the artists who said they wanted to be in the band. And so uh, further rehearsals ensued and it was about this time that I caught wind of it. And um, I, f I realized that, okay, well, a lot of people might travel with a guitar, but nobody travels with a drum set. So um, I went online and found a used drum kit, uh, a trap set, I think I bought from a musical family in Francistown. Um, somebody who knew somebody on staff loaned an, an electric bass. Um, the, the band played again the next week and then I, um, I actually set the, the instruments up in the music room at Hillcrest where I live and the artists started coming over on Monday or Tuesday afternoon to rehearse um, and then would go on and play a 15 minute set on, on Wednesday nights. I, there was a lot of debate about the band's name since there were almost never the same people in it from one week to the next. Um, so I convinced them that there's an, a, this apocryphal story about J.P. Morgan having been approached with a request to make a contribution to, to the McDowell program back in the 20s. And he's purported to have said, well, I won't give one thin dime or a red cent for you who you want to seem to want to build a, a halfway house for indigent bohemians. <laughs> so the name of the band was the indigent bohemians. Um, they played every Wednesday night from the, the end of May until the beginning of October. 
and it was one. It was the most extraordinary, like, through line of of um, sort of joyous and um, happy to be frivolous sometimes, but also sometimes really deep. Um, and uh, I am. I am. I have been dreaming about um, building an AV recording studio at McDowell so that we might sort of set the conditions for that kind of thing to happen more in the future. Um, think that um, I will um, maybe close with uh, something that a, a Chinese artist who is in residence said to me, I think it was 2005, um, and one of the things that we always do at McDowell is ask people, you know, what were the high points and what could be better about your stay at McDowell? We, we do it formally, but I had asked Zhui Di um, how, you know, what, was his studio satisfactory? Was the food, was everything okay? And he said that um, when he was living in China, he lived with his family in a one-room apartment in an apart in a in a block of flats where there is a bathroom at one end of the hall and a bathroom at the other end of the hall and because of what he was writing he would go to one of those bathrooms and close the door of the stall and that was where he would write because uh, as a dissident he was um, vulnerable to um, retribution and his answer to me was so when people at artist residency programs ask me how are the conditions I say the conditions are good <laughs> um, with that maybe I'll um, take some questions if there are any or I <laughs> apologize. And uh, people who are online should go to the chat line and Ed let us know uh, whenever you're ready to read a question. Who would like to ask the first question? Just raise your hand and then stand up, please. Um, I went to, when I went to the Christmas party, I noticed that there were a lot of young people and I just was wondering if is the um, more of the residents now younger than they used to be? I mean, I also talked to someone recently who was 69 years old and, you know, was a resident. But I was, the, the energy from all the young people, um, yep. I talked to them, they were, they were surprised that they were in a group of young people, but of course they found that very... Yeah, energizing. Um, yeah, energizing, right, to be with all kinds of new ideas. So I yep. just wondered no, about a, the demographic. It's a, it's a fair question, and I've, um, we have a um, data person who is a wizard, as you could see by my little graphs there. Um, and I, I was very curious about that. So she's programmed a f the front end on our database so that when I open it in the morning, I can click a button, and it tells me the average age of the people who are in residence today. Um, I find that the group dynamics fluctuate pretty dramatically at McDowell. They always have, but I'm starting to look for correlations between things that happen and age. But the, the fact is that um, the average age when I started was about 40. The average age last year was about 41. 
Um, I think what is happening is that there are not very many older artists and a, a lot of artists in that dense range between, you know, 25 and 40. Um, and it, and it, <laughs> Michael Shaven, when he was in residence, once said that, yeah, why are there's so many young people here? Why? What's going on? And Courtney, our missions director, said, well, Michael, it's not really that they're younger, it's that you're older. <laughs> yes, please, stand up so we can all hear you. Okay. Take your time. Is it possible that there aren't as many older people applying because they may think it's too late or less likely that they'll be considered or find a place? Do you see that, like... Are there plenty of applicants yeah. that are older? Yes. From in, all over? Yeah, yeah. We have. Does it help to be from another country or, or to live in Manadno? Or, you know, no. No. Okay. No. So what is the magic thing? The, well, the, the eligibility is that you're over 21 and that you're not currently enrolled in a college or university. Right. Other than that, anyone can apply to McDowell. Um, historically, we've sort of had 25 to 85 year olds, and the, actually, there's huge benefits to having um, the that spectrum. The um, the younger artists bring energy, and the older artists bring a savvy about how to make your way in a world that isn't really looking to reward um, artists financially. That's just not a. That's not one of the this country's. Um, organizing principles. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. I got, I got another one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, piggybacking on that because you know there were so many young people at Christmas time. They, they were hoping that there were some older people who would help direct them to where were the outlets, especially the film photographer and so forth like that. And yeah. just piggy, I just wondered, is yeah. there any? Um, Resources that like yeah. the New York office offers to well, some of those. Well, the the reality is also that um, because there are three hundred artists who come through in a year, and there are three hundred sixty five days, and they are on no fixed schedule, so that during the course of any one artist five weeks in residence. They will be with a group that is very young, and they will be with a group that is much more diverse in age because of the comings and goings. So um, we are actually exploring some things that we might be able to do with artists post-fellowship. Um, but you know that making connections is just one aspect of the, the fellowship. And the one, everybody knows that you get the time to work in solitary, in solitude, and you, um, everybody who applies has that foremost in their mind. But what they're most surprised with, I think, is when they leave, they have three new friends who they're going to stay in touch with for for the rest of their lives, and that is a that is a powerful force. My uh, other question, justice. I just want to say, is I. When I worked there, Mr. Shabby was the cook, and this is what was on the menu, and if you didn't like it, you didn't eat. You know, that was it. <laughs> when they're there, you had not not free, dairy free, vegan. I was I was afraid to even eat anything because I'm no diet restrictions because I might be depriving someone who could only eat some of these things. So that must be a nightmare in the kitchen. How do you cope with all the diets that patience, people patience, oh, patience? You anticipated. Yeah. Thank you. What I was just going to say, which is that I know of one person in the room uh, who has been a McDowell Fellow, and apparently more than one of you. And I was wondering whether anyone who has been in residence as an artist wanted to make any comments, if you don't mind my. No, no. Raising that, and if not, we'll go on to the next question. Ah, yes, there's one. John, could you stand up and speak? Up? I was at McDowell um, that same year with Louise, um, Louise Alma, and I was I used to buy the booze for her. <laughs> <laughs> she, we became friends, and she'd walk around with that coat and just 
drive that coat so good, <laughs> entertained. And she was really crotchety, very crotchety. She would pass the money to me and have me, because I had a car there, have me go down and get her wild turkey. <laughs> big, big jugs of wild turkey. <laughs> there, there was a, there was a, um, we, we had a birthday party for her uh, the two years that I, I, I was with her, and her birthday happened to be October 31st. And so uh, a friend of mine named John Bisbee, who is a sculptor and a, almost feral human, um, dressed up for um, Halloween. Um, he was a welder, and so he had like, he had his um, welding leathers on and a, a helmet and he had taken the oxyacetylene uh, co uh, hoses and tucked them into his trousers. And he was, he was on rollerblades, rollerblading around <laughs> Bond Hall. And when the time came for uh, a toast to celebrate Louise's 95th birthday, um, he skates right up to her in the middle of the room <coughs> pulls up his mask and gives her a, like a long, wet, two minute kiss. <laughs> and he's, he was probably 24 at the time. And she pops up from that and was like, she, she brightened right up. <laughs> Out came, uh, I think it was Jack Daniels that year, that, but everybody had a shot at Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, while you're thinking of a question, I can't resist after what John that telling you that in the late 80s, we went to a Monadnock music concert. Virgil Thompson was there. James Bowley was conducting. And I was with a pianist who kept looking in the back of the room. And I said to her, why are you looking in the back of the room? She said, that's Louise Tullum. And I said, who's Louise Talbot? And we went to the back of the room, and the pianist introduced herself. And Louise Talma said to her, you know, your recording of my music is the best one ever made. And that's the pianist whom you heard play the <laughs> She played some McDowell, uh, David. Questions? Online? I have a question, and the question is, it's been on all our minds, but I, by the way, I saw all those different colored professions. I didn't see lawyers, <laughs> but as one of those, I weighed right in. The change of name mm -hmm. from McDowell Comedy to McDowell, can you tell us a little bit about what brought that change about? Sure. Um, well, I think that everyone is aware of a lot of seismic shifts that are moving through uh, American culture. Um, one of those movements is uh, bringing to the foreground um, a, the fact that a lot of our institutions and um, laws and the way our, our culture um, tied directly back to the colonization of land that was essentially stolen. So colony is a word that offends a lot of people. Um, I, I myself am a believer in the, the re I believe that words have multiple meanings. It didn't, it didn't bother me. But it bothered a lot, a lot of people. And if it bothers a lot of people, um, it's so easy to not use it. So um, we made that move without, um, with, with a lot of consideration. But if you think about taking away something that's hurtful, um, and there's nothing really lost. All right, you've all had time. Yes, would you stand up, please, and bring it all here. What's it like for artists coming to rural New Hampshire and getting used to living in Peterborough? 
Yeah, um, so most of the artists who come are coming directly from dense urban areas. Um, there, um, but like, I, I guess I can't give you a, a, there isn't a sweeping generalization that answers that question. We get the full spectrum from um, artists who um, might be in the studio furthest from the main hall, but move out there and only use the assigned bedroom as a locker to go change their clothes and get a shower because they just want to be in the woods all the time. And we have people who come who are a little concerned as to whether or not the coyotes are <laughs> friendly. Um, and I mean, McDowell is, uh, has a lot of has a lot of trails and a, a lot of wildlife, um, and mostly people just take joy in both the the quiet, like this in the winter. There are times when you can you can literally hear the snow falling from an up the upper branches to the lower. It's a, it's un, unheard of in urban environments, and um, and I think that. Maybe the most important thing that happens is the artists have to bundle all of their real responsibilities and family obligations and friendships and stuff them into boxes and put them under the bed before they come to McDowell. So once they're at McDowell, all that stuff has been put away. And what you have is um, Artists who are there with a deep intentionality about pursuing the creative project that they've brought, and now there's nothing in the way. So when they're walking to their studios, there's a, a kind, there's a freedom in that that they don't feel anywhere else because they, they wake up in the morning and go straight to their project. If um, they can, after dinner, they can go right back to their project. They don't spend any time thinking about what to buy for dinner or to cook it or to clean up after it or to do any of the things that normally dis derail the thought process. So I think it's, it's, it's a, an entirely different mindset at its best that um, it just sort of adds fuel to the fire. Add anything online? Uh, no questions, but uh, a comment from Kathy L. Yes, my first job was working in the kitchen at McDowell, and I'm now an artist. <laughs> we have time for one more question, and then we'll have our reception. And David, can you stay a few minutes to chat? Sure. Yes, you get the last question. Please stand up. David, um, I've recently been studying why New Hampshire has at least four We'll say colonies, we'll say art group, Dublin, St. Gardens, McDowell, and Pennsylvania, which was in Nelson. And I'm going to do a small class at Keene State. And of course, the spin offs are everybody knows about Faulkner and Abbott Thayer selling camouflage to the U.S. Army, and all those mansions that exist in Dublin. And as a. Excuse me, what is the question? Why, why New Hampshire? And I asked John years ago, and she gave me a very wonderful quote. She said, they leave me alone. And she <laughs> you have more or less articulated too, you know, going to McDowell buys time. But all these other places, all these other colonies, they, they, they came together for what you described, like the rock, you know, the, the music band, a camaraderie. So the question is, why New Hampshire? Yeah. Well, and I can, I can, um, I think that you're, you're actually talking about sort of the utopian movement of the late 1800s. There are actually people going from urban areas on the East Coast, inland, finding a small parcel of land and trying to build the kind of society that they want to live in. Um, and I think that the, the reason that McDowell is, exists today, whereas those are all gone to the winds, is that we kick everybody out after eight weeks. So you people come to a utopian place with that intentionality, but you cannot sustain it for a life. But you can do it for eight weeks. And so at McDowell, that, that 
the sort of the fierceness of um, focus on uh, creativity and learning and exchanging ideas is refreshed every week. More people come, more people come. And I think that might be the difference. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, come back first Friday of March for Ilona Quichen. Very different. It'll be very interesting. And once again, uh, our speakers are all volunteers. Uh, they come here uh, to support the Civic Center. And thank you for doing the same.